Hey everyone, welcome to the online program of Amrita IAS Academy. My name is Sibi Joy and as part of our monthly current affairs MCQ program, this is part 3A of July 2020. So without any delay, we will go into the questions. Consider the following statements. 1. India was the first country in the world to have launched a national program for family planning in 1952. 2. Mission Parivar Vikas aims to reduce India's overall fertility rate to 2.1 by the year 2025. 3. The National Family Planning Program has introduced the injectable contraceptive under the Antara program. Select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A, 1 and 2 only, Option B, 2 only, Option C, 1 and 3 only and Option D, all of the above. So looking at this, the first statement, it's based upon a certain uh, current affair uh, topic known as Mission Parivar Vikas and it talks about the National Family Program which is India, one of uh, India's uh, major programs towards you know population management. So under that, India was actually the first country in the world to have launched the National Program for Family Planning in 1952. That is the right statement. Looking at that, we can eliminate option B, that is two only. And the third statement, that is the National Family Pro Planning Program has introduced the injectable contraceptive under the Antara program. That is also absolutely right. So that was also recently happening. And taking that into account, I can say that option C and D, that is one and three only, and option D, all of the above, is among that, that now we managed to make it a 50-50 analysis. Second statement, even if you are not aware of it, just try to look at the logic behind it. Mission Parivar Vikas aims to reduce India's overall fertility rate to 2.1 by the year 2025. Yes, that statement is true. This has been there in the news cycles consistently. There has been discussions on India's uh, fertility rate and what is the fertility rate that India is aiming towards. So taking that into account, I can say that all the three statements are right and the option D, all of the above seems to be the right answer. Let's look at the explanation. The answer is D. Statement 1 is correct because India was the first country in the world to have launched a national program for family planning in 1952. Over the decades, the program has undergone transformation in terms of policy and actual program implementation and currently being repositioned to not only achieve population stabilization goals but also promote reproductive health and reduce maternal, infant and child mortality and morbidity. Under the program, public health sector provides various family planning services at various levels of health system. So, the first statement is right. Second statement, Mission Parivar Vikas aims for improved access to contraceptives and family planning services in high fertility spreading over uh, seven high focus states. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has actually launched the Mission Parivar Vikas in 2016 with special focus given to 146 high fertility districts of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Jharkhand with an aim to ensure availability of contraceptive methods at all levels of health systems. Its overall goal of Mission Parivar Vikas is to reduce India's overall fertility rate to 2.1 by the year 2025. The third statement, the National Family Pro Planning Program has introduced the injectable con contraceptive in the public health system under the Antara program. This pro contraceptive is highly effective and will meet the changing needs of couples and help women space their pregnancies. So that is the explanation for the National Family Program question. Hope you all understood this. Let's go for the next question. Which of the following are the economical and ecological benefits of adopting the DSR or the direct seeded rice technology over the traditional transplanting technique? 1. Conserve water and energy. 2. Eliminate usage of fertilizers and weedicides. 3. Reduction in methane emissions and global warming potential. Choose the correct code. Option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 2 and 3 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. And option D, all of the above. So looking at the statements, it talks about a specific technology known as the DSR technology. Now we may be familiar with this or we may not be familiar with this, but just let's look at the logic. What does DSR offer in economical and ecological benefit over the traditional transplanting technique? So the first statement, conserve water and energy. Yes, the traditional transplanting technique of rice transplantation actually conserves a lot of energy and a lot of water. So taking that into account, I can say the first statement is right. Let's eliminate option B, 2 and 3 only. Looking at the second statement, eliminate usage of fertilizers and weedicides. To eliminate something is a very absolute term. So to say that uh, you can completely eliminate fertilizer and weedicide seems to be a bit illogical because you can, you can maybe reduce it but cannot completely eliminate it. So taking that into account, I can say that the second st statement seems to be a bit irregular. Let's remove the second statement. You are left with just one option, that is option C, 1 and 3 only. Let's check the third statement. Reduction in methane emissions and global warming potential. Yes, quite possible because traditional transplanting technique of rice transplantation actually results in methane emissions and uh, large possibilities towards global warming. So this technology could reduce it probably. Taking that into account, I can say that the option C, 1 and 3 only seems to be the right answer. Let's look at the explanation. The answer is C. So in the northwestern Indo-Gangetic plain or the IGP area, transplanted rice is predominantly cultivated and 
which requires at least 25 hectare per hectare or centimeter of water for puddling operation which creates a dense clay layer in the subsoil to prevent seepage losses. So, it requires 130 plus 10 uh, HA CM of irrigation in addition to adoption of suitable variety and application of recommended dose of fertilizers to yield to realize yield, uh, yield levels of 6 plus 6 plus or minus 2 tons per hectare. So, generally about 40 percentage of all irrigation water goes to paddy cultivation in the region and it is estimated that flooded rice fields produce 10 percentage of the global methane emissions. Also, injudicious use of nitrogenous fertilizers is a common feature in paddy cultivation which also results in nitrous oxide emissions. So, it is actually tra traditional rice planting method, transplanting method is actually resulting in immense global methane emissions and also nitrous oxide emissions. But researchers have developed the new uh, DSR method which Races of nursery for transportation is, in, is done away with and farmers can avoid the major problem which is faced in Punjab there is labor shortage for transplanting due to peak demand. In case of delay in monsoon or shortage of water, DSR gives the farmer flexibility to take up direct sowing of paddy with a suitable dura duration variety to fit into the leftover season. This allows timely sowing of the succeeding rabbi wheat. Direct sown rice consumes less water compared to transplanted flooded rice. Energy demand for pumping of irrigation water is also less and savings can be much higher during the deficit rainfall situations compared to the transplanted rice. Direct sowing can be practiced for cultivating both coarse rice and basmati rice wherever feasible in the northwest IGP region. And DSR with reduced tillage is an efficient resource conservation technology that holds great promise in the IGP area because of its following advantages. Saving up to 25 percentage of water in DSR. Saving of energy up to 27 percentage of diesel as pumping energy for field preparation, nursery rising, puddling and reduced frequency of applying irrigation water. Saving of 35 to 40 man days per hectare. And enhanced fertilizer and weedicide use efficiency due to placement of fertilizer in the root zone which makes the second statement not correct. And early maturity of crops by 7 to 10 days helps in timely sowing of succeeding crops, reduction in methane emissions and global warming potential, little disturbance to soil structure and enhanced system productivity. So, it is a detailed explanation about the direct uh, DSR technique of uh, rice farming and uh, it shows what is its advantage over the traditional rice planting tech, transplanting technique. So, I hope you all read through this explanation, understand it. It is a very simple explanation. Just try to gather the major points and definitely if there is a question on this, you will be able to handle it. So, with this, we will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about comets. 1. They are mostly made up of dust, rocks and ice. 2. They hold important clues about the formation of the solar system. 3. Comets do have lights of their own. Select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A 1 and 2 only, option B 2 only, option C 1 and 3 only and option D all of the above. So, looking at this, let us take the third statement. Comets do have light of their own. No, only stars have light of their own. All the other objects are actually reflecting the light emitted by the stars. So, taking that into account, I can say the third statement is wrong. So, leave the third statement out, you are left with just two options, option A and B that is option A 1 and 2 only and option B 2 only. We managed to make it a 50-50 elimination. The second statement is present on both of them. So, we can say the second statement, they hold important clues about the formation of the solar system to be absolutely right. Now, let us look at the first statement. They are mostly made up of dust, rocks and ice. That statement is absolutely true because comets are mostly made up of dust, rocks and ice. Taking that into account, I can say the option A1 and 2 only is the right answer. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is A. Statement 1 is correct because comets or dirty snowballs are mostly made up of dust, rocks and ice. The remnants from time the solar system was formed over 4.6 billion years ago. In the distant past, people thought of comets as long haired stars that would appear unpredictably in the sky. The second statement is correct because comets can range in their width from a few miles to tens of miles wide. As they orbit closer to the sun, they heat up and release debris of dust and gases that forms into a glowing head that can often be larger than a planet. Astronomers study comets since they believe that they hold important clues about the formation of the solar system and it is possible that comets brought water and other organic compounds which are the building blocks of life on earth. Statement 3 is not correct because comets do not have light of their own and what humans are able to see from earth is the reflection of the sun's light of the comet as well as the energy released by the gas molecules after it is absorbed by the sun. The visibility of a comet cannot be precisely predicted since a lot depends on the way the outbursts of gas and dust play out determining how much of a good show the comet will put out for observers. So, that is the explanation for comets. I hope you all understood the explanation. Please read through the uh, statements and its correct explanation for any doubts if you have or you can contact us and we will go for the next question. Consider the following statements about government securities or GSEC. 1. These securities are issued by the central government to borrow from financial markets in order to meet its fiscal deficit. 2. They are considered as risk-free, guilt-edged instruments. 3. They can be used as a collateral to borrow funds in the repo market. 4. They are non-tradable in the secondary market. Select the correct answer using the given below code. 
option a one and four only option b one two and three only option c three and four only and option d two and three only so looking at this government securities are something we'll be learning as part of our economy syllabus for your civil services examination so we'll be covering this very detailedly in as a regular preparation goes and one thing you can know note about that is the first and second statements are absolutely right these securities are issued by central government to borrow from financial markets in order to meet its fiscal deficit yes that is true second they are considered as risk free gilt edged instruments yes gsex are considered to be risk free gilt edged instruments taking that into account i can say the only answer with option uh, <coughs> one and two in that is option b one two and three only let's look at the third statement let's also check the fourth statement third statement they can be used as a collateral to borrow funds in the repo market yes that is absolutely true four they are non tradable in the secondary market no that is false they are actually highly tradable in the secondary market so taking that into account uh, leaving the fourth statement as wrong and taking that the one say one two and three are right we can say option b one two and three seems to be the right answer let's look at the explanation the answer is b statement one is correct because government securities are securities issued by the central government to borrow from financial market to meet its fiscal deficit and they are issued for short term as well as long term where short term securities with maturity less than one year are called as treasury bills while long term securities with a maturity of one year or over are called government bonds or dated securities they consider safe investments as investors are, gar gar are a guaranteed return of both interest and principal from the government of india second statement is correct because they carry practically no risk of default and hence are called as risk free gilt edged instruments third statement is also correct because they can be used as collateral to borrow funds in the repo market but the fourth statement is not correct because they can be sold easily in the secondary market to meet the cash requirements so that is the explanation for gsex or government securities hope you all understood about this let's go for the next question consider the following statements about the chabahar port one it is located in the gulf of oman two it serves as afghanistan's only oceanic port three through this port india would get access to central asian markets which of the above mentioned statements are correct option a one and two only option b two and three only option c one and three only and option d all of the above so looking at chabahar port even if you are not aware about it let's look at the country of afghanistan afghanistan is a landlocked country so uh, while learning about your uh, international relations or learning generally about geography of the major countries which surround india afghanistan is this one such country which is a neighbor of india but it is completely landlocked so taking that into account i can let's take the second statement it serves as afghanistan's only oceanic port afghanistan is a landlocked country and hence it does not have any contact with oceans or seas so taking that into account let's say the second statement is wrong remove the second statement you are left with just one option option c 1 and 3 only let's look at the water 1 and 3 it is located in the gulf of oman yes through this port india would get access to central asian markets both of these statements are right in this context so let's take the answer as option c 1 and 3 only the answer is c the statement one is correct because chabahar port is a seaport in chabahar located in southeastern iran not in afghanistan but in southeastern iran on the gulf of oman statement 2 is not correct because it serves as iran's only oceanic port and consists of two separate ports named shahid kalantri and shahid behishti each of which has five berths Statement three is correct because in 2003, India, Afghanistan, and Iran, under the North-South Transport Corridor Framework, signed the Chabahar Port Agreement, allowing all three countries to utilize the Chabahar Port as a trade hub. Chabahar Port gave India an access to Central Asia's markets through the country of Afghanistan. I hope you all understood this. And uh, this thing, uh, map which shows the how the Chabahar Port is located and how India has got access to it. If you look at it, it is located right next to Gwadar Port of Pakistan, and it's located in the Gulf of Oman. It's in Iran. it crosses from iran towards afghanistan through zaranj and reaches kabul so that is the diagrammatic representation i hope you can take this to understand the uh, understand more about this uh, chabahar port and its connection with the north south uh, corridor i hope you all understand this with this we are going for the next question in context of pradhan mantri fazal bima yojana consider the following statements one this crop insurance scheme is being administered by the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare Two under the scheme, there will be a uniform premium of only two percentage to be paid by farmers for all Kharif, Rabi, and horticultural crops. Three, the scheme is compulsory for loanee farmers availing crop loan or KCC account for notified crops and voluntary for others. Choose the correct code option A one and two only, option B three only, option C one and three only, and option D two and three only. So, looking at this, I like to take the second statement because it has the absolute directive all in it. Under the scheme, there will be a uniform premium of only two percentage to be paid by farmers for all kharif rabi and horticultural crops so uh, even the only 2 percentage seems to be a bit uh, doubtful and also that all for all kharif rabi and horticultural crops seems to be a bit doubtful because each of the seasons vary in their duration the risk factors so taking that into account i can say the second statement is a bit illogical and i would like to remove it 
Remove the second statement, you are left with just two options option B13 only and option C1 and 3 only. Let us take the second statement, the third statement is absolutely right because it is present both of the options. That is, this scheme is compulsory for loanee farmers availing, availing crop loan or KCC account for notified crops and voluntary for others. Let us look at the first statement. This crop insurance scheme is being administered by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. Yes, it talks about crop insurance. So, definitely I would say that the crop insurance scheme is being will be administered by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. Taking that into account, I can say the option C1 and 3 only seems to be the right answer. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is C. Statement 1 is correct because PMFBI aims to provide a comprehensive insurance cover against failure of the crop thus helping in stabilizing the income of farmers. And it covers all food and oil seeds crops and annual commercial horticultural crops for which past yield data is available and for which requisite number of crop cutting experiments are being conducted under general crop estimation survey. It is being, this scheme is being administered by the Ministry of Agriculture. Second statement is not correct because there will be a uniform premium of only 2 percentage to be paid by farmers for all kharif crops, 1.5 percentage for all rabbi crops. In case of annual commercial and horticultural crops, the premium to be paid is 5 percentage. The premium rates to be paid by farmers are very low and balanced premium will be paid by the government to provide full insured amount to the farmers against crop loss on account of natural calamities. The third statement is also right because it is compulsory for loanee farmers availing crop loan or KC account for notified crops and voluntary for others. So that is the explanation for this question. Hope you all understood about this. Let us go for the next question. In context of the INS Vikrant, consider the following statements. One. This diesel electric attack submarine is indigenously manufactured by the Mazgaon Docks Limited. Two, with this development, India has become the third nation in the world to do so. Choose the correct code option A1 only, option B2 only, option C both 1 and 2, and option D none of the above. So, INS Vikrant is actually India's aircraft carrier. It is not the diesel electric attack submarine which is indigenously being manufactured by Mazgaon Docks Limited. So, taking that into account, I can say the first statement is absolutely wrong. And the second statement with this development, India has become the third nation in the world to do so. No, there are India has become the fifth nation because there are other countries which have already developed their own uh, aircraft carriers. So, I can say both the statements are wrong in the context of INS Vikrant. And so, I choose the answer option D, none of the above as the right answer. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is D. Statement 1 is not correct because Indian Navy is operating the single aircraft carrier INS Vikramaditya, the 45,000 ton carrier brought, uh, brought from Russia. Cochin Shipyard Limited will de deliver a country's first indigenous aircraft carrier INS Vikrant weighing 40,000 tons by February 2021. Statement 2 is not correct because with this India will join the allied group of indigenous built aircraft carrier nations. At present only the US, Russia, Britain and France have the capacity to design and build aircraft carriers of 40,000 tons and heavier. So that is the explanation for INS Vikrant. I hope you all understood about this. Let us go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the consumer price index or CPI. 1. It is computed by the Office of the Economic Advisor, OEA, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. 2. It is used for measuring retail inflation in the economy. 3. Reserve Bank of India, RBA considers CPI combined as the key measure of inflation. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A, 1 and 2 only, Option B, 2 only, Option C, 1 and 3 only, and Option D, 2 and 3 only. So, looking at this, it is about consumer price index or CPI. First statement is computed by the Office of the Economic Advisor of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. No, it is the wholesale price index of the WPA which is uh, computed by the Office of Economic Advisor. CPA comes under the Ministry of Statistics. So, taking that into account, I can say the first statement is absolutely wrong. Remove the first statement, you are left with just two options, option B2 only and option D2 and 3 only. So, automatically the second statement becomes true for both of them. That is, it is used for measuring retail inflation in the economy. Let us look at the third statement. RBA considers CPA combined as a key measure of inflation. Yes, the RBA is taking the CPI combined as the key measure of inflation for its monetary policy determination and decision. So, taking that into account, I can say that the option D or option uh, D2 and 3 only seems to be the right answer in this context. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is D. Statement 1 is not correct because the National Statistical Office or NSO under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implement Implementation releases the consumer price index for rural, urban and combined on a monthly basis. WPA is computed by the Office of the Economic Advisor, OEA, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion and Mini of Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So, understand that the CPA of Rural, Urban and Combined is released monthly basis by NSO. Second statement is correct because CPA is commonly an index measuring retail inflation in the economy by collecting change in price of most common goods and services. The third statement, RBA and other statistical agencies study CPA so as to understand the price change of various commodities and keep a tab on inflation. It is also, CPA is also a helpful, helpful pointer in understanding the real value of wages, salaries and pensions and the purchasing power of a currency, country's currency and regulating prices. That is the explanation for this question. I hope you all understood about CPA. We will go for the next question. 
Question number 9. Consider the following statements about the Dal Lake. 1. This urban lake is also known as the Lake of Flowers. 2. This wetland is a Ramsar site. 3. It is famous for its floating gardens known as Fumdis. Select the correct answer using the given below code. Option A 1 and 2 only, Option B 1 only, Option C 2 and 3 only and Option D 3 only. So, this question is about Dal Lake and this urban lake is also known as a Lake of Lars. Yes, Dal Lake is also known as a Lake of Lars. But taking the third statement, the second statement, second statement, this wetland is a Ramsar site. Under the Ramsar Convention, many wetlands are declared as Ramsar sites, but the Dal Lake is not a Ramsar site yet uh, till now. And hence, the second statement is completely false. Taking out the second statement, you all have just one, two options, option B1 only and option D3 only. We are very sure that the first statement is right. So, automatically the third statement is wrong. But let us also check the third statement. It is famous for its floating gardens known as Fumdis. While the Dal Lake does have floating gardens, they are not known as Fumdis because Fumdis are a fa uh, famous uh, pheno environmental phenomenon seen in Loktak Lake of Manipur. So, taking that into account, I can say the first statement is the only statement which is right and option B1 only is the right answer. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is B. Ex statement 1 is correct because Dal is a lake in Srinagar, the ca summer capital of Jammu and Kashmir, India. It is an urban lake which is the second largest in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and it is integral to the tourism and recreation in Kashmir and is named as the Lake of Flowers or Jewel in the Crown of Kashmir or Srinagar's Jewel. The second statement is not correct because Vular Lake is one of the 37 Indian wetlands designated as a Ramsar site, but Dal Lake is not a Ramsar site. Vular Lake is also a lake which is present near Srinagar. Statement 3 is not correct because the lake covers an area of 18 square kilometers including its floating gardens. The floating gardens known as Rad and Kashmiri blossom with lotus flowers during July and August. Fumdis are a series of floating islands exclusive to the Loktak Lake in Manipur state in northeastern India and they are heterogeneous masses of vegetation, soil and organic matter in different states of decay. So that is the explanation for this question. I hope you all understand this. Let us go for the next question. Consider the following statements about the Spike LR. 1. It is a fire and forget anti-tank guided missile with automatic self-guidance system. 2. It is indigenously designed and developed by the DRDO. Which of the above mentioned statements are correct? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D none of the above. So looking at this, let us take the first question. It is a fire and forget anti-tank guided missile with automatic self-guidance system. Yes, Spike is a fire and forget anti-tank guided missile with the automatic self-guidance system. So, I would say the first statement is right. We will be learning about it as part of our security or it has been present in, uh, in the current affairs recently because of uh, India's recent uh, purchase of Spike LR missiles. And the second statement is wrong because it is not indigenously designed and developed by DRDO but rather India bought it from Israel. So, taking that into account, I can say the first statement is right and the second statement is wrong. It was there in the current affairs recently, it was there in the news cycles consistently. Let us go for the answer that is option A, one only. Let us look at the explanation. The answer is A. The army is said to place a repeat order for spike LR or long range anti tank guided missiles from Israel as part of an emergency procurement. Statement 1 is correct because spike is a fire and forget anti tank guided missile and anti personal missile with lock on before launch and automatic self guidance. The missile is equipped with an imaging infrared seeker. Statement 2 is not correct because it is developed and designed by the Israeli company Rafael Advanced Defense Systems. It is available in man portable vehicle launched and helicopter launched variants. So, that is the explanation for this question. The answer is option A. I hope you all understood this. Let us go for the next question. The Pragyata guidelines sometimes seen in news is related with, with which of the following? A. Sexual harassment at workplace. B. Healthcare workers working with COVID infected patients. C. Digital education and D. Digital payments. So, Pragyata guidelines have been there in the news recently with regards to the digital education which is being implemented all across the country because of the lockdown due to the COVID pandemic. So, this has been there in the news consistently, it has been there in the news cycles uh, over and over again. So, please try to remember this. The answer is C option uh, which is digital education. Let us go for the explanation. Union HRD minister virtually released the Pragyata guidelines on digital education. It provides a roadmap for carrying forward online education with enhanced quality. It recommends a cap on duration number of online sessions in a day for students from class 1 to class 12. The Pragyata guidelines include 8 steps of online or digital learning that is plan, review, arrange, guide, yak or talk, assign, track and appreciate. These steps guide the planning, planning and the implementation of the digital education step by step with examples. So, it is mainly concerned with the online digital education being offered in India especially for classes 1 to 12. That is the idea behind the Pragyata guidelines. I hope uh, you all remember it and understand this. With this, we will go for the next question. In the context of the Bharatmala Pariyojana, consider the following statements. One, it is a centrally sponsored roads and highway construction scheme of the government of India. 
2 it is funded through the central road fund or the crf 3 it is an umbrella project under the ministry of road transport and highways so bharat mala pariyojana actually talks about the national highway program uh, which under which it is being known as the bharat mala pariyojana so since it talks about highways and road transport the third statement is absolutely right that is that it is an umbrella pro project under the ministry of road transport and highways so try to remember bharat mala is related with road transport and highways the third statement is right so we are left with just two options option c three only and option d all of the above the second statement is funded through the central road fund yes it is a centrally sponsored road and highway construction scheme of government of india yes it is a centrally sponsored scheme of the government of india so i would say that the option d all of the above is the right answer let's look at the explanation the answer is easy and the answer is D. The expert appraisal committee of the environment ministry has recommended the grant of environmental clearance for the development of an economic corridor. The satellite town ring road or the STRR between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka which is a part of the Bharat Mala Pariyojana. Statement 1 is correct because Bharat Mala Pariyojana or project is a centrally sponsored and funded road and highways project of the government of India. The estimated investment for 83,677 kilometers or 51,994 miles committed new highways is estimated at rupees 5.35 lakh crore or US dollar 75 billion dollars making it the single largest outlay for a government road construction scheme. Second statement is also correct because it is created by the CRF which was created as a non-lapsable fund under the Central Road Fund Act of 2000 by imposing a cess on petrol and diesel to build and upgrade national highways state roads, rural roads, railway under or over bridges and national waterways. So please understand the role played by CRF and how it is a non-lapsable fund under the Central Road Fund Act of 2000. The third statement is correct because it is an umbrella project under the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. So that is the explanation for this question. I hope you all understood this and remember this. With this we are ending part A of this video. This is CB Joy signing off. Thank you. Yeah.